do, if you, if you have time and feel uh, it'll be helpful, do read Ezekiel 36, 16 to the end. Uh, that's what Matthew will look at later on. And if you've read it, that's wonderful. Don't feel any great pressure. Do you use this time to pray and to prepare?
Wonderful. Well, very good morning to you. Uh, great to uh, be together, whether you're here in person or on the live stream. Uh, what a privilege. Let me just start with uh, some notices. Uh, my name is David. I'm the pastor here at Good News Church. Uh, coming up next Sunday, uh, we're going to share communion. Um, so if you're here in the building, do tr please remember to bring um, some liquid and some bread, if possible, to bring with you. And if you're at home, try and have those with you uh, ready to go. Well, on Tuesday, there's an opportunity to join uh, on Zoom with uh, some Rico Tice evangelism training. I'm sure it'll be really, really helpful. Um, do look at my weekly email, we'll get in touch if you want details of that. And on Friday this week, at 7.30pm, anyone who's read Pilgrim's Progress and would like to discuss how they found it a bit like a book club. So um, particularly we'll be just looking at what positively did you take from the book? What did you find helpful and encouraging or challenging from the book? Uh, so it's coming Friday at 7.30pm uh, on Zoom. Do let me know if you'd like further details. For now, let's just pause. A chance to prepare our hearts and in a moment I'll pray. Let's pray. We do rejoice in you, God, that you are the God who gives salvation. Thank you that you rescue your people. Thank you that you've rescued us and called us your own. Thank you that you call us, having been rescued, to worship you, to be worshippers of you. Please do help us to delight in you, to worship you, to give you the glory this morning. We pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to do a sort of confessional song, as we did a couple of weeks ago. This time we're going to say, uh, it all together. Um, this is Psalm 130. Um, perhaps, can I, if you're able, encourage you to stand, and we'll say these words together. So do stand. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watch and wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Wonderful. <coughs> Let me pray in response. We praise you, God, that there is forgiveness with you, that all of our sin is perfectly dealt with, and that you have uh, brought us to a point where we can with reverence serve you. And so please help us to put our hope in you, to trust you, the Lord of unfailing love, in whom we have full redemption. We delight in you. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to be thinking about the Lord's name and how it's glorified. And we're going to start by doing that by worshipping Jesus as we uh, recognise that every knee will bow before the name of Jesus one day. And so we're going to sing, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And if you're in the building, do please hum and at home, sing along.
do have a seat. So we're going to come to a time of prayer and we're going to pray through the Lord's Prayer. So let me pray. Our Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to call you our Father, God. You are amazing that you would have us as your children. We rejoice that in Jesus we are adopted into your family. We delight to be yours. And we love that we can come to you in prayer and that you listen to us. You are better than any earthly father. You give us good things and care for us each and every day. And we praise you, Father. Hallowed be your name. We do glory in you, our God. Your very name is holy. You are magnificent. In every way, you are flawless. Your every word, thought, action, everything is perfection. All your decisions are right. And all people everywhere should give you glory. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. We did pray to you, God, that in heaven all is perfect and right, that all the heavenly beings worship you rightly, as we saw at the start of Ezekiel, that you have great angelic servants who worship you. We praise you that it is perfect in heaven, and we long that you would make it more like heaven here on earth, that your rule would come more perfectly down here. Please, Work that in us, we pray. Tear down our idols. Purify our worship. Please would we honour you rightly. Please would you correct injustice. Please look after the oppressed and the needy. Give us today our daily bread. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give us all that we need. We need you to give us everything. It is only you who gives us good stuff. So we need your provision each and every day. Please give us food for today and tomorrow and every day. Give us water to drink and shelter. Please clothe us just like you clothe the lilies and the plants of the field. Please give us friends, family and help. Please give us all that we need, Heavenly Father. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. We do want to recognise that we are terrible sinners before you, Holy God. You are holy and we are deeply unholy. We are desperately sinful. Please forgive us. And we ask that you would help us to forgive others. You know how quick we are to hold grudges and for bitterness to rise. Please help us to be quick and eager to forgive others. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We are so easily tempted, Heavenly Father. We desperately need your help. Please guard us from temptation. Help us to be pure and to resist evil. Help us this coming week when we find ourselves tempted. Help us to flee sin. Help us to resist the devil and to see him flee as well. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. We do acknowledge before you, God, that everything is yours. All belongs to you because all things come from you and are for you. Please would you be glorified. Please be glorified in absolutely everything. And please help us to glorify you in all that we do and say and think. And we pray these things to your glory, Heavenly Father. Amen. Amen.
Well, we're continuing our theme of the name of God, and we're going to sing or hum uh, about how wonderful Jesus' name is, and how secure it is for us, and how much joy it brings us. We're going to sing how sweet the name of Jesus sounds. So do stand and sing or hum. Again, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, when the people of Israel were living in their own land, they defiled it by their conduct and their actions. Their conduct was like a woman's monthly uncleanness in my sight. So I poured out my wrath on them because they had shed blood in the land and because they had defiled it with their idols. I dispersed them among the nations, and they were scattered through the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their actions. And wherever they went among the nations, they proclaimed my holy name. For it was said of them, These are the Lord's people, and yet they had to leave his land. I had concern for my holy name which the people of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. Therefore, say to the Israelites, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, 
which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the corn and make it plentiful and will not bring famine upon you. I will increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the field, so that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. Then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds, and you will loathe yourselves for your sins and detestable practices. I want you to know that I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Sovereign Lord. Be ashamed and disgraced with your conduct, people of Israel. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. On the day I cleanse you from all your sins, I will reset your towns, and the ruins will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated, instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass through it. They will say, This land that was laid waste has become like the Garden of Eden. The cities that were lying in ruins, desolate and destroyed, are now fortified and inhabited. And the nations around you that remain will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt what was destroyed and have replanted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Once again, I will yield to Israel's plea and do this for them. I will make their people as numerous as sheep, as numerous as the flocks for offerings at Jerusalem during her appointed festivals. So will the ruined cities be filled with flocks of people. Then they will know that I am the Lord. <clears throat> Thanks, Wendy. Let me pray as we come to this God's word. We do pray, Heavenly Father, that this morning we would be good soil, that as your word is planted in us, we would hold on to it, believe it, and persevere, and so produce a crop, we pray. Please help us not to be the bad soils, but to be good soil for your word. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know whether uh, you followed the news of Shamima Begum, who uh, left the UK when she was 15. Uh, she travelled to Syria to join the Islamic State. Uh, there she married an Islamic man and she served the Islamic State police. Uh, her job was both to recruit more women, that was part of her role, and she was also there to enforce their laws. Uh, she saw appalling horrors and always sided with ISIL. 
she didn't regret her decision to join them uh, at uh, how many years ago that it kind of blew up. Yes. She was pregnant and she wanted to come back to the UK. And you may remember there was quite a lot of news about it at the time. And her citizenship was stripped from her. And a week or so ago, she was again refused permission to return to the UK in order to appeal her case. Well, I wonder as you consider Shamima Begum, do you feel she deserves to come back? She's essentially unrepentant and has an appalling history of rejecting Britain. She has supported and encouraged those who would kill and harm British people, as well as many other nations. Or do you side with her or with the British government? If Dominic Robb, who I think is the Foreign Secretary, uh, were to bring her back, what would he say? I, I don't think he could possibly stand up and say, we brought her back because she is deserving of coming back. But he might have been able to say, we brought her back to reveal the glory of Britain. That she is was one of our people and should be brought back to reveal the glory of Britain. It sounds very odd, doesn't it? But that's essentially what God is saying in Ezekiel 36, 16 to the end of the chapter. Just count through verses 16 to 23 and see how many times God speaks of his name. Let's have a look through. How many times does God speak of his name in those verses? 16 to where I wonder whether I've done my maths right, but I think it's about five or six times, depending on your definitions. Uh, five or six times God speaks, and there are two clear thrusts as he speaks of his name. Firstly, the first thrust is that God's people have profaned his name. Profaned means to treat something with irreverence or to abuse it. God's people have been appalling about God's name. They're a bit like Shamima Begum, rejecting Britain and deliberately going to Syria uh, and being derogatory of Britain. Well, that's what God's people were like. They profaned God's name. The second thrust is that God will save his people for the sake of his name, for the sake of the glory of his name. Sounds a bit arrogant, doesn't it? Just listen to verse 22 again. Therefore say to the Israelites, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, it is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, essentially save them, but it is for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. We tend to think of it as being quite arrogant and unpleasant if someone makes much of themselves being a hero. The person who goes and rescues someone and then, and then goes, it was all about me. We, we tend to feel they're a bit arrogant, that they should be somehow saying, well, you know, well, this is how I did it and this person was worthy of rescuing. But God's point, I think, here is that they are unworthy of rescuing. They are spectacularly undeserving of being rescued. And sorry to keep labouring, but it's the same with Shamima Begum. She does not deserve to come back to the UK. However, it could have been that Dominic Robb, or whoever makes the decision, could have said, for the glory of Britain, we will go and we will bring her back. For the sake of the name of Britain. And in that sense, it might have been but I don't think people would have said that's a very arrogant thing to say because it's such a spectacular act of, to an undeserving person. 
Uh, the big point at the start here of chapter 36, beginning of verse 16, is that God saves to glorify his name. God saves to glorify his name. Verse 23. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I have proved holy through you before their eyes. God's goal is to be honoured rightly as the Lord, to be glorified as the Lord, to be proved holy. That was true uh, in Ezekiel 36, and I think it's still true today. It's tempting to think we are saved because we are worth saving. Tempting to think we're saved because we're particularly valuable. Perhaps we can think we're saved because we're a cut above others. But I think these verses in Ezekiel should cut us down to size. They should show us that just as Israel was not saved because they are particularly worthwhile in themselves, so we are not saved because we are particularly worthwhile. They were saved for God's glory, and the same is true today. Paul writes of us that we were dead in our transgressions and sins. We were godless and wicked. If you today are in a position of turning to the true God, turning away from idols, worshipping the Father through Jesus by the Spirit, it is only because you've been rescued. Of ourselves, we are rebels, undeserving of rescue, like Shamima Begum. We've turned our back on God, angrily made ourselves his enemies. By nature, we are deserving of nothing but God's disdain and wrath. We need to be careful we don't overthink our value. I know that cash is going out of date these days, and even more so with the pandemic. But how much money would have to be on the floor before you picked it up? How many of us would bother to stoop down and pick up a 1p coin? I, I know I don't pretend to, if I'm honest. <laughs> Well, some, some people do, fair enough. What about if, if, for some of us who don't, how, how would you do, I mean, do, would it be a pound that you would step down for, stoop down for? I think I probably would for a pound. I probably wouldn't for one P. I think God, here in Ezekiel, says Israel are like mutt, even less deserving of picking up than the one P coin. Not worth picking up in the slightest. I think we're the same. There is nothing that is particularly wonderful in us. It's important to recognise that. Because I think there's two dangers. If we think that we are worth, worthy in ourselves, or valuable in ourselves, the first is, I think it greatly risks lying to ourselves. Romans 3 tells us that no one is good, not even one. All who sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's God's view of humanity. So we need to be careful we don't overinflate our worth because we might be lying to ourselves. But I think it also risks putting ourselves in a higher position than those who aren't saved. We're in danger of saying we are saved because we are worthy, we are worthy. But actually that person who's not saved, well they're not saved because they're not worthy, they're not worthwhile. That's sometimes I think how I think, and it's wrong, it's arrogant, it's dangerous thinking, it's proud. Now we are like Israel, terrible sinners deserving of God's wrath. There is no good in us, corrupt from conception, prone to do evil. That's how we start this chapter, and I'm aware we're in the second half of Ezekiel, which is meant to be good news. And it is. Because this doesn't stop God, does it? Israel is spectacularly undeserving. 
As we've gone through Ezekiel, we've seen they are horrendously idolatrous. They are deserving of God's wrath. But, but God is concerned for his name. God saves to glorify his name. That is true. But it's also true the reverse. God glorifies his name by saving. God glorifies his name by saving. God could look at Israel, who profane his name among the nations, and he could say, I'm only going to judge you. That would be perfectly reasonable. That would be perfectly acceptable. He could glorify himself by not saving anyone at all. Equally, he could force everyone to bend the knee back for him right there and then. There are many ways God could glorify himself. But look at what he actually does glorify himself through. Verse 24, I'm going to read to verse 30, so quite a chunk. Just think of how, this is how God chooses to glorify himself. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people. And I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will eat a call for the corn and make it plentiful. And will not bring famine upon you. I will increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the field. So that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. Just consider that salvation. They profaned his name among the nations. They've been horrendously arrogant and awful, and yet he glorifies, glorifies his name by saving them. By saving them. And it's not superficial. He doesn't just bring the Israelites back to the land and go, that will do. He won't just sprinkle water on them so they'll be clean. No, he says, I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. It's a beautifully complete salvation, isn't it? He will bless them abundantly. So much so that the land will flourish where they live. God will do everything that he does thoroughly. He will take Israel who has totally rejected him. Israel, who he has judged, and he will rescue them. He will not just bring them back, but he'll, he'll make it so that they can obey him. He himself will remove the idols and the impurities from them. He will give them his own spirit to help them live for him. Well, this is complete salvation. This is how God chooses to be glorified. This is how God chooses to be glorified, by saving rebellious sinners. And that's true today. That's true today. Just listen uh, to Hebrews, some words from Hebrews 10, speaking of Jesus, the great high priest. This is what Jesus does for us today. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest, speaking of Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Just ponder the completeness of God's salvation. He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. 
there is a completeness to God's salvation. His salvation does not depend on us. It does not depend on you. In and of yourself, you are not worth saving. That's what God basically says. That's good news. Because God is glorified by saving. We can be sure that our salvation is not partial, and it's not warping. Do you ever feel like you have question marks over your salvation? And many of us, I'm sure, will have felt like that. Perhaps we feel like we've not done enough. Perhaps we look at our sin and go, it's too great. Or perhaps we look at our faith and go, it's, it's too faint. It's too wobbly and variable. Well, the good news from this passage is that your salvation does not depend on you. Please don't fear a salvation that depends on you. Because salvation is done by God for his glory. He chooses to glorify himself by saving. Remember verse 32. I want you to know that I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Sovereign Lord. Be ashamed and disgraced for your conduct, conduct, people of Israel. God's not doing it for their sake. The saving and flourishing of God's people is not even God's primary purpose. And that sounds bad. He is most concerned with the glory of his name. But it's good. Because he chooses to glorify himself by saving. By saving miserable sinners like the Israelites. And it's true today. God is most glorified by saving miserable sinners like you and me. Let me say that again. God is most glorified by saving miserable sinners like you and me. This is how God himself chooses to glorify his holy name. It's vital for our assurance. God doesn't save you because you are particularly worthy of saving. So if you feel unworthy of saving, it's good news. You aren't worthy of saving in and of yourself. God saves you because he is God, a God who chooses to glorify his name by saving. If anything, bizarrely, God is almost more glorified because of the depths of our depravity and our rejection of him. Because we are so unworthy of salvation, God's name is the more glorious. So God isn't most glorified by our obedience. Nor is he most glorified in our submission to him. Nor is he most glorified in his judgment over sinners. God is most glorified by saving sinners like you and me. Now that doesn't mean it's bad to obey God. Please don't go out on a a depraved streak of sinning as though that will glorify God's name more. No, consider Israel. They have been saved and God says, or they are going to be saved, and God says he will save them and he will complete that salvation by making them more obedient. And so there is an importance to obedience. We are told uh, that uh, we should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But God is most glorified in saving miserable sinners like you and me. And that means that that one penny coin, or even less than that, that piece of mud, glorifies God because he turns that mud into great treasure. He turns that mud into a pearl of great price. God himself makes us valuable. We in ourselves are not valuable. It is God who calls us valuable. It is God who makes us valuable. He makes us into treasure. 
And so God is most glorified when we as sinners acknowledge and recognise that we are worthless and helpless and come to him to be saved. And he gets to do his full work of salvation on us. We're told there is great rejoicing in heaven over sinners saved. Wonderful news. And it's worth saying this should affect our evangelism. Remember, we're like that piece of mud who's been turned into a glorious pearl. And the temptation is to think of ourselves as the pearl, but we need to remember, of ourselves, we are the mud. And so as we come to evangelism, as we're thinking, how can I tell someone else about Jesus? We need to make sure we're not lofting it above them, not being arrogant, considering ourselves the superior. I think that's sometimes how I feel. Well, that's not helpful, and it's wrong. In and of myself, I am like the mud, unworthy of salvation. But I can tell people of how I've been made a great pearl, counted a great pearl by my wonderful God. All the glory goes to him. On the final day, when we're all worshipping around the throne of the Lord. I hope you look forward to that day. When we're worshipping there before the Lord. We will be worshipping most of all, not because we've had a good quiet time, if I'm really our Bible. Nor because I've summoned up the courage to speak to someone about Jesus. I won't be worshipping about those things. I won't be glorifying God's name because of those things. Most of first and foremost. No, we'll be standing before the throne worshipping God for saving us. That he is the God who glorifies himself by saving. More than anything I can do for God in this life is what he has done for me. And that is what brings him most glory. I will be gladly paraded through heaven as an example of a sinner who is unworthy of salvation, uh, but my wonderful God has saved me. And I don't tend to be political. And I don't really have to make a big deal out of it. I think it would have been a wonderful thing if we as Britain had brought back Shamima Bay. I think that would have spoken gloriously of us as a nation. And I'm sure there's much complexity to it, and I'm not, I'm not really an authority on these things. But wouldn't it be wonderful for the name of Britain if we had said, she's awful, she's undeserving, but we're going to bring her back because she's ours. Because she's ours. Well, that's how God you two and me. We're worse than Shamima. Of course we are. But God glorifies his name by saving. God saves to glorify his name. And he glorifies his name by saving. And so all the glory, praise and honour should go to him. Well in our Zoom chat later, can I encourage you to stop asking the question, do you find this reassuring? Do you find this reassuring? Well now, for now, can I ask you to consider, what is it that God is saying to you this morning? What is he speaking to you? And in a moment, I'll pray. We do praise you, holy God, that you are a God who is glorious in and of yourself. You are holy and glorious and good. You choose to demonstrate that to the nations, to all peoples, by saving them. And we rejoice in that. We rejoice that we are saved by you, that 
you get most glory by saving people like us. Help us to believe that, to trust that, to know we are saved because you have done it in us. And help us not to be arrogant. Help us not to be fools and think of ourselves more valuable than we are but to delight that you count us valuable, that you make us a great treasure for your own glory. And so please would we glorify your name in all that we think and say and do. Would we be quick to cry out for how we have been saved and slow to think too much of ourselves. Help us to glory in you. For your name's sake we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to finish by singing or coming, or hail the power of Jesus' name. And a, it's a particularly rousing version of it, which I, I will resist singing to because I desperately want to sing along to it. It's a wonderful hymn. But do uh, hum along if you're in the building and sing at home, or hail the power of Jesus' name. and encouragement. Give us a spirit of unity as we follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ.
Amen. Amen. Well, great joy to be with you this morning, and may God bless you and see you soon.